is were the biggest sign of the end times. Well, when Jesus Christ walked the earth, there was a day when he sat on the Mount of Alas, and his twelve disciples came to him privately with a question that was bothering them. They asked him, Tell us, when will all this happen? What sign will signal your return? At the end of the world. And in Matthew 24, verse 4 to 8, Jesus answered his disciples, He said, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Look closely. The first sign that Jesus highlighted in verse 4 and 5 was watch out for deception. Meaning there will be many false teachers, many false prophets. Many will be wolves dressed in sheep's clothing. On the second sign of his coming, Jesus said you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. And isn't that where we are today? So the very first sign that we're told to watch out for is deception and the fact that it's repeated twice. This highlights the importance of it. After Jesus lists the signs of the last days, which are deception wars and disputes among nations, devastation and disasters in the forms of famines, pestilences and earthquakes, and then persecution. Jesus tells his disciples that this is just the beginning. And if this is the beginning, what could be next? Well, Bible prophecy tells us of some interesting battles to come. The battle of Gog and Magog, described in Ezekiel 38 and 39, as perhaps one of the most debated events in biblical prophecy. Gog and Magog refers to the enemies against whom God will wage an apocalyptic war at the dawn of the Messianic Age. It is believed that GOG is a person who rules over the land of Magog. Now the who, what, and how of this battle is a contested area among some scholars, with all believing that the GOG and Magog battle is an invasion of some kind. But opinions differ on its participants, location and timing. Biblical scholars also disagree regarding timing of the invasion. Some believe it will be just prior to the rapture of the church and onset of the seven-year tribulation. Others will think it happened between the rapture and the tribulation. Some think it will be around the middle of the tribulation. And the final camp thinks it will happen just prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so according to the Bible, when God and his army attempt to overcome Israel, God will come to the rescue of his people and will quickly annihilate the invaders by supernatural means. In Ezekiel 38 verse 18 to 22, we are given a picture of what will happen, and here are the details were given. And it will come to pass at the same time, when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath, I have spoken surely and that day. There shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth, shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against God throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops and on the many peoples who are with him. 
flooding rain, great hailstorms, fire and brimstone. So this is just a glimpse of the Gog and Magog battle. But there is also another battle to come. The final battle at the end of the world. Between the forces of good and evil. Armageddon. The Bible tells us, demonic spirits will gather all the rulers and their armies to a place with the Hebrew name. Armageddon. John then tells us the scenes he saw in Revelation 19. Then I saw heaven opened. And a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True. For he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire. And on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood. Except himself he wore a robe dipped in blood. And his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven, dressed in the finest of pure white linen, followed him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. Like juice flowing from a wine press, on his robe at his thigh was written this title. King of all kings and Lord of all lords. He further goes into detail and describes what he sees. Then I saw the beast, and the kings of the world, and their armies, gathered together, to fight against the one sitting on the horse, and his army. And the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who did mighty miracles on behalf of the beast. Miracles that deceived all who had accepted the mark of the beast, and who worshipped his statue. Both the beast and his false prophet were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Their entire army was killed by the sharp sword that came from the mouth of the one riding the white horse. So what can we learn from past battles and those predicted to come? Firstly, war is not the biggest sign of the end times. It's one of the signs. The Bible places more of an emphasis the on the rise of deception when it comes to the signs of the last days. Secondly, regardless of what comes, God always protects His children. God always defends those who have put their trust in Him. And finally, Christians are not to pay attention to one sign over others but the collective group of signs. Mark the beginning of birth pains, as Jesus warned. But this is no reason to fear. Because we know what is to come. Society changes. Whenever there are major events in a particular country or region, society changes. Go back in time, and you'll see this in early church history. In the Roman Empire, particularly under Nero, there was an acceptance in society those days for Christians to be persecuted and even martyred. In the Victorian era in Britain, one of the more accepted signs of success for males included having a wife and family, having a good home, and owning a horse and carriage for transportation. When the Great Depression happened in 1929, Society changed and people established new norms, like thrift gardens in order to survive. After the 2008 financial crash, society changed. People began to diversify their investments, their savings and how or where they kept their money. And just look at how many things that are widely accepted. Today but 50, 100 or even 200 years ago. They were not the dorm violence on TV. Violence in music and in video games. This has all become the norm in society, when many years ago, it was not as prevalent as it is today. Premarital sex was once taboo, but in this day and age people are making a living. Having premarital sex and selling it online. 
These are just a few examples of changes that have happened in society over the years. But what does the Bible tell us about the changes that will happen in society to signal how close we are to the second coming of Christ? Well, the first change that I want to talk to you about can be found in 1 Timothy 4, verse 1 and 2, where the Bible says, now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Let me just list these points to you. People in the last days will turn away from the faith meaning there will be an apostasia falling away. And what does this look like? Well, it looks like less and less people attending church. Less and less people professing to be Christians. Less and less people practicing Christianity in their daily lives when it comes to things like prayer and reading God's word. People in the last days will pay attention to deceitful and seductive spirits and doctrines of demons. This is the point I want to focus on. So we'll come back to it in a moment. And people in the last days will be filled with hypocrisy and speak lies. This means you will have many who come saying and preaching one thing but living in a completely different man. Then the final point is that people's consciences are seared. Meaning there will be a coldness to humanity a lack of love, a hardening of the heart. And this is all because of sin, being prevalent in the lives of many. Now, I want to focus on doctrines of demons. Society in the last days will be more welcoming of new teachings, false doctrines, alternative gospels. And this is precisely what the Bible means when it says, doctrines of demons. The devil will never come out in the open and present himself. Instead, he will use men and women to spread deceit. And here, here are some of the key messages from people who preach under demonic influence. They will tell you that you will get to heaven by being a good person and doing good things. God accepts you for who you are. It's okay to sin when you've been good for a long time. But God's word tells you that you cannot earn salvation through good works. Salvation comes only by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and turning away from sin. God's word tells you to deny self and to keep your flesh under subjection. And finally, the Bible tells you that the wages of sin is death. And so there is no trade off between good behavior and sinning freely. So, you see, these are doctrines of demons. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe to the channel to update our best videos.